Welcome to Against the Stream. Anybody here for the first time tonight? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to anybody tuning in online for the first time. You could give us a wave in your camera. We'll see you. I am, but my video's having some difficulty. All right. Welcome. Boise, Idaho. All right. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Yeah. I'd like to begin class by asking you to talk to each other in the um, attempt to help you build community against the stream as a, a Buddhist community. And uh, it's a core part of Buddhism to connect with the other participants, the other students, the what we call the Sangha. Um, partially, we come to learn about Buddhism. We come to meditate and develop our, our wisdom and compassion, the practices. And then a core part of it is knowing other people and developing relationships with other people that are also walking this path. So I'd like to start by having you in small, small groups, talking to each other, introducing yourselves, getting to know each other over the months of attending, whether it's on Zoom, I put you in the little um, breakout rooms on Zoom or here in person. The topic tonight, I'm not gonna actually, I don't have a topic, I'm gonna do a Q&A tonight. Um, but the topic the you know for the q a and and the intro is um what parts of buddhism are challenging for you what are what are you know from what you know about buddhism so far are there some parts of it that feel like you got some questions about it it's challenging um you know is it the stuff around reincarnation buddhism teaches that we're in a multiple life scheme, re rebirth, reincarnation. Does that make sense to you or is that challenging to you? Buddhism teaches uh, karma, that total personal responsibility, that we're totally responsible for all of our volitional actions and that all negative, unwholesome, negative uh, actions have a karmic fruit, a karmic consequence and all positive uh, volitional, intentional actions have a positive outcome can be a little confusing. You can look around the world and be like, doesn't look like that. <laughs> Looks like a whole bunch of bad shit happening to good people and good shit happening to bad people. Um, how does karma make sense? Does it make sense? Um, or the, the Buddhist uh, teaching truth that there's no self, that there is not a soul that is permanent. There is not a self that is uh, unchanging that everything's impermanent, including what we call the self, that it's a somewhat of a fabrication, the feeling of I am a solid, separate, continuous entity is a fabrication of the mind. It's not actually the truth. Does that make sense to you? Is that challenging for you? What are the other things? Maybe, maybe it's compassion. It's com you know, I, a lot of times I'm always surprised where people come to me like, I just don't know what the fuck compassion is. <laughs> Um, but that's not an uncommon dilemma for people going like, I don't know how to meet my own pain with care, with friendliness, with compassion. Uh, that, that seems impossible, seems so counter to our natural instinctual drive away from pain, turning towards pain with tenderness seems ludicrous. How, how the fuck are we going to do that? Maybe that's, or even, or non-attachment, not, you know, this sort of Buddhist teaching that says you can exist in this world without clinging to anything or anyone and therefore not suffer. Does that make sense to you? Is that something that, how do you practice non-attachment in your relationships? What is a non-attached, loving, committed, connected relationship look like? You know, there's the Buddhist idea of non-clinging and then there's a reality of i'm super fucking attached to my partner and my kids and my friends <laughs> and you know and i i'm you know the, the the teaching and the potential buddhism gives us all of these beautiful teachings non-attachment compassion not self forgiveness forgiving everyone how about that forgive everyone for everything the end of suffering Nice idea, beautiful. And some of you have been at it for years. And like myself, I've been at it for decades. 
And I see, you know, mostly verified faith in Buddhism, mostly like, yep, this makes sense. I see how in the long term it works. And then I still have some questions about reincarnation. I still have some questions about not self. Theoretically, I get the impersonal nature of things, but it all feels pretty fucking personal. <laughs> Even though I ultimately understand it's not so personal. Uh, karma. I believe that karma is what's happening here, cause and effect. But because it doesn't make sense really without a rebirth, if karmic uh, fruition can come in, in future lives, it's hard to understand, you know, when it looks like people are getting away with terrible behavior. And this Buddhist perspective that says they're not getting away with it. They own that karma. They'll be reborn with that karma. Just because you die in this lifetime doesn't mean that's the end of your karma. So some of these things, what are the things for you? Maybe I, hopefully I stirred the pot a little bit in you. Some of you are like, yeah, fuck Buddhism. <laughs> And, you know, most of us probably go like, yeah, this, I want to know this. I want to embody this. I want to have forgiveness and under and take full responsibility and see others as fully responsible for their actions and, and learn to not take that, which is not personal, not personal. I want to develop compassion. Most of it probably makes sense to most of us. But what are the parts that you grapple with around practicing Buddhism, learning Buddhism, engaging in it. What are the parts that are a little challenging? Maybe, I think I sometimes encourage people, uh, you know, set aside the stuff that doesn't make sense yet. Focus on the stuff that does make sense. Mindfulness makes sense. Practice mindfulness. Reincarnation doesn't make sense. Don't get too caught up in it. What are some of the things that you've found you sort of set aside? Reincarnation or karma or or forgiving your enemies, or having compassion for your own pain? What are the things for you? So find small groups, like two or three people, and talk to each other about some of the things around Buddhism that you find challenging. I know it's challenging in here, to, or it feels challenging for me to um, create the happy medium of uh, climate, too cold or too hot. I have, it, I have the AC set to, I think, 72 or 73, so it'll go on. It'll go, if I leave it lower, it's too cold. It stays too cold. Anyways, one of our practices is becoming aware of what is perceived as pleasant or unpleasant or neutral sensation. So you can use the temperature in the room as that. <laughs> too warm, a little unpleasant. Too cold, a little unpleasant and learning to, to meet the unpleasant with acceptance, with tolerance, ultimately with some sense of compassion. So finding a way to sit upright, relaxed. You wanna find a way to sit so that your body is upright and uh, your spine is erect without being rigid or stiff. And allowing your eyes to be closed. Establishing mindfulness, present time, non-judgmental awareness with an attitude of kindness, of friendliness, of self-acceptance, accepting your mind, your body, your experience, just as it is in this moment. Think of friendly awareness, kind awareness to your experience. This human experience of a mind, a body, a heart. The sense doors of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. With all of our memories and all of our plans, hopes and fears. Bringing awareness to the body, sitting, feeling the sensations of contact with the chair, the cushion, 
feeling the sensations that the breath creates, rising and falling of the belly, expanding and contracting of the chest as the air enters and exits through the nostrils. Bring mindfulness to the breath and let everything else recede to the background, disengaging from the thinking mind, bringing kind awareness to the breath. Of course, the attention gets drawn back into thinking. Non judgmental awareness, just noticing I'm thinking about the future or the past. Then disengage, come back to the breath. Come back to feeling your body, your hands resting in your lap, on your legs.
and you notice tension clenching the jaw or the belly tightening release soften relax into whatever it is that you're resisting the discomfort the fear the craving just soften into it let it arise let it pass rather than resisting
Continue to keep the attention focused on the breath or you can expand, investigate. Investigate the impermanent nature of all the sensations in the body, how they're changing. Investigate the impermanent nature of sound, smell, taste, sight. When your experience, whether it's physical or emotional or mental, feels unpleasant, know it, name it. This is unpleasant, painful. Give your attention to the pain rather than resisting it, investigate it. Likewise with pleasant experiences, give your attention to the pleasant. Investigate the impermanent nature of pleasure and pain. Include the mind in your mindfulness. Observe how thoughts arise and pass. Some are pleasant, some are unpleasant, some neutral.
where we understand the impermanent, constantly changing, transient nature of sensation and emotion and thought. Where we begin to let go, let go of clinging to the pleasant, let go of resisting the unpleasant. The more we let go, the less we suffer, the more ease we experience. Nothing worth clinging to, nothing worth suffering about. Everything worth caring about. Spending the last few minutes turning towards the heart, towards the kind, compassionate, loving tendency of the awakened heart, the compassionate heart. The intention to meet ourselves with friendliness with compassion, our own pain. Perhaps saying to yourself, may I learn to meet my pain with compassion, with mercy, with tenderness. May I, meet, may I learn to meet the pain of others with compassion, with mercy, with tenderness. Bringing the attitude of loving kindness. May I learn to be at ease with myself just as I am, with this mind, this body. May I experience happiness, joy, may the happiness that I experience continue, grow, increase. saying to ourselves, may I be free from suffering, the suffering of clinging, self-centeredness, aversion, and the suffering of greed and hatred and delusion. May I be free, may I end suffering in my own life through my own efforts. Saying to yourself, may I be happy, may I be at ease, may I be free. Over and over in your heart, whether you're sincere about it yet or not, just training the mind. May I be happy, may I be at ease, may I be free. Then extending these same wishes 
to each other here in the room, here on Zoom, the Sangha, practicing together. Just as I wish to be happy, I wish for your happiness, for your ease, for your freedom from suffering. Sending love and kindness to your community, to your family, your friends, your loved ones. And extending in wider and wider circles, the intention, the attitude of compassion and loving kindness outward in all directions, east and west, north and south. To all of the living beings, all sentient beings in existence, in all realms of existence, in all phases of life, both the wise and the ignorant, the young and the old, our friends and our enemies, and all living beings, do what needs to be done to experience ease in their own lives. May all living beings do what needs to be done to end suffering in their own heart through their own efforts to end ignorance, to end confusion. May all beings be happy. May all beings be at ease. May all beings be free from suffering. So just Q&A tonight about anything you'd like to ask about, but sort of where we started, if, if there's some, it's always interesting to look at uh, when you're on a path like this and you're learning Buddhism or you've been practicing Buddhism for some time, what are some of the parts that are challenging for you that don't quite make sense? Not that I'm gonna make them make sense for you. I might not, I might make it even more confusing for you. I'm not sure. Uh, but just wanted to kind of start there of what are your, what are your questions about the Buddha's teachings, uh, which include the meditation instructions, mindfulness, loving kindness, compassion, forgiveness, include all of the topics that I said earlier, karma and reincarnation and no self and but ask the questions that feel alive for you and your practice, not just, don't try to just intellectually stump me. That's not the game. What's a real for you and your practice, please. My thoughts are racing, so I apologize if it doesn't come out properly, but uh, being a practicing Buddhist uh, myself, I understand those concepts logically as you mentioned earlier, um, but to be compassionate towards myself and towards other people, let's say there's like a connection that must be broken or trauma bond or even just a simple that you know this isn't working out for me 
Um, how do you compassionately and with respect for the other person or persons uh, share with them your detachment from them without it seeming closed? Um, because I am very good at like trying to have a conversation, trying to express, you know, unfortunately this isn't healthy for either one of us, or yeah. maybe just for me. Um, but because they do not practice the same level of detachment, you're sometimes met with a lot of hostility, aggression, clinging, uh, anger. And then to again let that flow off of you, yeah. You again seem cold, and then it's kind of a little bit difficult to not be a people pleaser and not respect your boundaries, but or respect your boundaries, but also you know, do you see what I'm saying? I totally do. Yeah. Um, I don't know how well you could hear it at home. I don't know how much, how well to summarize it. Maybe I'll just answer it and hopefully the answer will be, you know, share some, some of my perspectives will be, uh, clarify what the question was around, around navigating difficult communications, um, where someone is going to feel hurt and how to maintain compassion, even though it's the right thing to do, ending a relationship, that it's time to end that relationship. Um, and how to stay in the, the compassionate place while still saying what needs to be said and doing what needs to be done. And uh, you, know, you were talking about seeming cold and that's the place for us to investigate. Um, and I can relate so much to this because I think I, in some of those, I have the intention to be compassionate when I'm in some of those difficult conflicts or, or, or and I want to be compassionate, but also I, I kind of just freeze. I shut, I am, a, a, I get a little cold and the feedback is you're being a little cold. <laughs> I'm like, I know I'm kind of frozen and I'm trying to be compassionate, but. My issue is I don't want to cave and also I. Hold the boundary. You know, I'm very assertive anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's hard to just say, it's not working. I'm sorry, this is a discussion. Yeah. Kind of thing. But, you know, if you're having feelings, we can talk about it, but it's usually just like anger. And it's like, okay, then we have nothing to discuss. Right. You know, let's look at some Buddhist pieces here. One is, yes, we're trying to be compassionate. And, and part of that compassion, it is compassionately listening to other people's pain, especially when it's been a relationship and we've, you know, and there's reasons for it to, to end. But the generous and kind and compassionate thing to do is, yeah, have some boundaries, but also say, like, I will hear you out. It's painful for me to hear you out, I, you know, but I will, uh, you know, so maybe a little bit more willingness, compassionate listening to say, oh, it's part of my practice too. I'll hear the anger, the accusation um, that you want to throw at me with the lens of equanimity. So the Buddha teaches compassion and equanimity as so connected. Compassion says, I care about you as, you know, I care about your pain. Equanimity says, I know that your happiness or unhappiness isn't about my compassion for you. It's about how you're responding to your pain. You're in pain right now. You're meeting it with aversion. You're creating suffering for yourself. You're then spilling that suffering on. So wisdom knows that. Like, okay, this is a person who's hurt, who's grieving, who's, and they're spilling it on me. So there's a way ideally with compassion to say, I'll hear it out, but also I won't take it on because I know you're responsible for how you're reacting to your pain. I'm not. I'm responsible for how I react to my pain and I'm responsible for how I treat you. So I'm trying my best to be kind, compassionate, patient, all of that. So the equanimity is an important piece in that and the compassionate listening and not going too quickly, I think, to like boundaries. You know, like we go a little, I think we have a tendency to be like, oh, you're going to say something unpleasant to me? Boundaries, rather than like, I can listen to something unpleasant. I can take that. You have some accusations of, of my betrayal for breaking up with you or whatever it is. Okay, let's, let's hear it. Say what you need to say. Rather than how fucking dare you, <laughs> you know, say what you need to say. Um... I also, you know, so there's, there's Buddhist right speech, you know, in the kind of communication. 
Is it true? Is it useful? Is it the appropriate time? We're looking at that. Am I coming from a place of kindness? Yes, it's true. It's time for this relationship to end. It's necessary. It's useful communication. It is the appropriate time. We've set this time aside to discuss this. And so we're doing all of those things. Sometimes in Buddhism, we can get so caught up in trying not to cause harm that we forget that sometimes the truth is really going to hurt people's feelings. And that, again, equanimity, you're not responsible. As long as you're telling the truth and it's appropriate and you're coming from as much kindness and compassion, you're delivering it in, in hopefully a kind way, not too harsh and not too cold. People can get their feelings hurt and you're not responsible for that. You might be accused, well, you're doing this or you're triggering me or whatever it is. But also just being able to sit in, you're responsible for your reaction. I'm not. I care about you and I would love to help you have more compassion for the pain you're in, but I, I can't do that for you. You have to do that for yourself. So the right speech and the equanimity and that acceptance that it's going to be messy sometimes. Relationships are messy. Breakups, impermanence, grief, anger and sorrow and attachment and all of that stuff. Now, here's the piece that I want to remind you, all of us. We fucking signed up for that shit when we got in the relationship in the first place. You got into a relationship. You know everything's impermanent. You know clinging is the cause of suffering. And you thought getting into a relationship was a good idea. And that it wasn't going to be difficult and that there wasn't going to be a beginning, a middle, and a probably difficult ending. So that piece, too, of stepping back and being like, I fucking signed. I, my eyes were open. I walked right into this. Falling in love in an impermanent universe. I'm signing up for the sorrow of relationships. Also, you know, whatever, however dysfunctional our partner is, like I saw the bus before I got on. <laughs> My responsibility, right? Like, you know, we wake up after the honeymoon of relationships and be like, what the fuck did I do? But also coming back to that personal responsibility, I signed up for this. Everything's impermanent. I'm entering into this. Whatever delusion we go into romantic relationships with, of like, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be all good. And then when it ends, it's going to be totally amicable. <laughs> We're going to come to, you know, the same, same time, same place, just not working out. We, go, we get so fucking deluded. But we can take responsibility for our delusions of like, I walked into this in, in delusion. I walked into this um, maybe with the best intentions and, you know. The Buddha chose celibacy. He said, you know, in this world where we cling, where we're wired to cling, to get attached, Going into relationships and trying not to suffer in those relationships, it's going to be really fucking difficult. You know what's an easier way not to suffer? Don't have sex. Don't have sex. Celibacy is a viable option. And not this homosexual anorexic, I can't have, you know, not this sort of neurotic avoidance but a healthy spiritual renunciation that says, you know, maybe for periods of time, I'm going to choose to not engage in that and, and, and experience giving all of my attention to myself meditatively, mindfully, and not experience the challenges there. And when we do choose relationships, full responsibility, I'm signing up for all of the diff joy and sorrow that's gonna come with relationships. It's a choice that I am choosing. I do not have to be in relationships. Celibacy is on the table and a healthy, we're Buddhists, right? We're like Buddhish. <laughs> it's not, a, you know, like in our culture, celibacy is like, what? Like that's, 
negation. That's some sort of extreme renunciation. We're practicing Buddhism. Celibacy is a beautiful choice, a healthy choice, not just out of avoidance, but out of I'm going to give my full attention to my process of healing and awakening. And out of, sometimes out of the humility of like, I, I'm not very good in relationships. I don't, I don't know how to do it very well. I'm going to do more internal healing before I engage. And then when we do engage that, like, and it's going to be a bit messy and it, there's going to be some suffering and, you know, it may not end well. And I'm signing up for all of that. And I don't want to be too dour, you know, also hopefully, you know, I'm bringing my mindfulness and my non-attachment and my compassion and all of that into the relationship with the hope that this will be a long-term sustainable loving connection and that when it is impermanent, not if, when, hopefully we will na navigate that. And, and hopefully I'm with somebody who will also understand the impermanence and that will grief is a natural part of it, but that we can do it in a skillful way. Like, are we choosing people who have that intention? I've said lots of time in this class about how um, I was married for about nine years and um, divorced six years ago, six or so years ago. Um, but I like to tell this story about on my first date with my ex-wife. Um, I gave her this lecture about impermanence. And she wasn't a Buddhist and I was being all Buddhist. And I was like, well, you know, everything, even all relationships end. And, um, and it's true, but it's not very romantic, <laughs> right? It's true, but it's not very romantic to, um, I was with a friend last night who just got married and the Buddhist, you know, and I perform weddings sometimes. And um, the Buddhist, you know, if we were going to do a Buddhist wedding vows, it would be something like, instead of like forever, <laughs> it would be something like, in this present moment, <laughs> I have the intention <laughs> to love you forever. <laughs> But we'll see. <laughs> Let's just take this thing one moment at a time. I have the intention. I love you so fucking much. It feels like I hope it lasts forever. But we'll see because everything's impermanent and that shit changes. And people change and in different directions. And so, you know, you go for it. But you always, you know, the Buddhist view, come back to, I know everything's impermanent. And I hope this is the relationship that will sustain all of the changes together, hopefully. But also, maybe not. We'll see. Let me check and see if my girlfriend's online or not and get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> get in trouble later. Um, Sure, Lucas. Uh, yeah, I guess I, my question comes at like, uh, have, I have trouble differentiating between like, uh, you know, whether or not I'm like consciously choosing to be celibate or I'm rationalizing uh, like avoidance of sexuality as being voluntary. Like, that I, I mean, maybe it's just like listening to like the wisdom part of me, but uh, I, I can get all of that like convoluted, I think. And, and so I guess like my question is like, where does it become intentional? And then where is it um, sort of like, like differentiating the, the avoidance aspect of that and then like ensuring that in, I'm not being avoided and I'm actually being intentional. That's a little confusing and mixed up, but I don't know. If you yeah. have any words on that, I would appreciate that. I don't think I have much on it. It's <laughs> the right question. Okay. It's the right, um, for those at home, if you couldn't hear talking about in periods of celibacy, when is it avoidance and when is it like intentional investigative renunciation? Um, and that is the right question. And, and it's a big question. 
Uh, and there's the monastics who say, I'm going to just take a lifelong vow. I'm never going to have sex again. And then there's those of us who are householders are saying like, well, I think I'd like to have a healthy relationship at some point. I haven't had much success so far. And so I'm going to take a break uh, and I'm going to do a period of celibacy. I've done a couple of long periods. I did two years in my 20s and about six months a few years ago um, of just saying, like, I'm going to take a break from all forms of sexuality, masturbation and sex and relationships and just let go of uh, satisfying that sexual desire in any way and intentionally satisfying it and be with the impermanent nature of desire and be with the loneliness and be with it. My sense is doing um, like a set period and not doing too much like, well, you know, thought I was going to be celibate, but not today, you know, of kind of saying like, I'm going to do it for six months. Or I'm going to do it for nine months. or I'm going to spend a year without any masturbation, without any sexuality, and just be with, you know, in that, for that period of time. And then when you complete it, then that's the right question. Hmm, year is done. Do I wanna try to re-engage with some mindful sexual activity? Um, or do I wanna continue this? This actually feels quite freeing to be celibate. And, you know, and then there's the difference between maybe celibates and, and, and abstinence. And, and I know this isn't your question, but there is a difference between being celibate and just not being able to get laid. <laughs> I know that's not your question and I'm just joking, but the intentionality behind I'm choosing not to do this. One last thing, I'm, I'm, you've maybe heard me talk about this before. I, after I spent a couple of years celibate in my 20s and, and had a sort of pseudo monastic practice as a householder, and, um, and then I fell in love and I broke my celibacy and then I was promiscuous for a little while. And then I went to um, Asia and thought about ordaining and thought like, maybe I'll just end up in the monastery and do the, the monk's life. And I went to the monasteries and I visited and I, uh, and I had this internal experience when I was in the monastery that I felt like for me, long-term celibacy would be avoiding some of the healing that I wanted to do in this lifetime around intimacy, around relationships. And so rather, it felt like that to me. And I could be, I could have just been could have just been my lust rationalizing, not, not ordaining, I'm not sure. But how it consciously it felt was, I got some work to do and some healing to do that is gonna have to be done in intimacy. It's gonna have to be done in a sexually intimate, connected. Um, I also felt like parenting was gonna be a really important part of my life and my healing. And that I didn't want to not have that experience in this incarnation. And so in my mid-20s, I made the conscious decision, I'm not going to live my life as a celibate. I'm going to be a householder Buddhist. This is my path. It's what makes sense to me. And there's two choices when you get really serious about Buddhism, monastic path or householder path. Uh, and then there's times in the householder path, path that we're on where periods of renunciation are completely appropriate. I'm taking time away from. That makes sense. Is that helpful? Yeah. Kind. I kind of. Yeah. No, I mean it's. You know, it's always. I, I think like drawing a line with all sexual activity and putting like, you know, a, a, a date stamp on it. I think is a useful way to put it. Yeah. Because then it's like, you know, like you said, at the end of it, then you can go. Okay. Do Do I want to actually like you know, probably there's some people that emerge, you know, at the end of that time. And, and then you have, okay, do I want to go deeper in an intimate way? Is it, and, and then it becomes a decision at that point, a new decision. Yes. So that, that's cool. Yeah. I, I like that. Yeah, and celibacy is not masturbating, not as, I mean, maybe there's something like with, um, 
abstinence where you are masturbating self self sexuality, but not engaging with others. There's a place for that too. Um, but I, I find, you know, in the Buddhist practice of that full renunciation of sexual activity, very powerful. Um, Sierra, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Noah. Hi, Sangha. Um, beautiful topic tonight. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to piggyback on this. So there's a book called If the Buddha Dated, and um, you've addressed a, a few a few things about um, relationships um, and uh, operating in relationships as a as a Buddhist householder, um, the ending relationships and celibacy and renunciation. But um, what I would love to hear a little bit about, and my question is, is um, you know how, how do we um, show up um, with the lens of Buddhism um, appropriately in romantic relationships specifically um, to the best of our ability with accepting that idea of impermanence and non-attachment and clinging because um, I personally am finding that to be very difficult. So I would love to hear um, what you have to say about that. Thank you. Did you hear it in the back? Yeah. Um, I feel like I said most of it already, but well, here, here's, the, here's the ideal. Everything's impermanent. All of our sensations and emotions and moods and interactions, everything's impermanent. We're trying to practice non-attachment. Non-attachment is the solution to not suffering about clinging to impermanent things. This is the Buddha's teachings, non-attachment. So in relationships, um, we often, the suffering in relationships is when we're attached. We cling, which means we're trying to control. We're trying to, you know, subtly or not so subtly manipulate, change, get the desired outcome from, you know, the situation, the one that you want them to be the way you want them to be, <laughs> uh, rather than how they actually are in that moment. We're clinging, we're craving, we're controlling, we're doing something. So we could just call it clinging. Clinging hurts us, and it also annoys them, <laughs> hurts them as well. It's suffering. Uh, ideally, and I'm using my hands as clinging. Ideally, you want to let go without disconnecting, right? So celibacy is saying like, oh, I suffered over here. So I'm going to like take some time away, disconnecting. But you can't do that when you're in a relationship. Uh, so instead of going from attachment to detachment and disengaging and avoidance, you, the ideal is I want to be non-attached but connected, present loving, tolerant, listening, uh, compassionate, forgiving. I mean, forgiveness is everything in relationship because we're going to offend each other. We're going to push each other's buttons. So forgiveness becomes the way to stay in a non-attached and non-aversive and non- uh, is can I meet you with mindfulness, with non-attachment, with compassion, with forgiveness? And the answer is sometimes <laughs> for all of us. Sometimes I'm good at that. And I can be loving and non-attached and connected and forgiving and compassionate. And sometimes I get mad and I become aversive or I become attached or I become critical or I become shut down. I freeze, whatever our responses, not the ideal. So my sense of relationship and what I try to practice in my relationship and is this dance of non-attached, loving presence, connection. And then there's clinging and then there's detachment and then there's reconnecting. And then there's some moments, hopefully longer than moments of loving connection. And then there's clinging and then there's detachment and then there's aversion and then there's shutdown and then there's reconnection. And then there's, I forgive you, please forgive me. And let me make amends. I didn't, my tone was off or whatever it was. And then there's reconnection. You know, and so forgiveness and amends and coming back into that connection. The idea that we're going to be able to maintain perfect 
non-attached connection is unrealistic. We're gonna cling and we're, and we're gonna probably overcorrect and we're gonna judge and we're gonna... So bringing forgiveness and amends into our relationships necessary so that we can reconnect over and over and over. Um, that's what it feels like to me. It feels like my experience and feels like what Buddhism is teaching us, teaching me about how to uh, not be detached and cold and avoidant, but be fully connected and, and vulnerable in relationship. And humble enough to go like, I'm gonna fuck it up. I'm gonna say something I shouldn't and react in a way that's not skillful. And, and then I'm gonna ask you for forgiveness, hopefully. I'm gonna remember to make amends and take responsibility and apologize and, and reconnect. I hope that's somewhat helpful, Sierra. Very, thank you very much. It's messy business. But it's also so beautiful. I mean, my, and I, I said, however long ago that was, 25 years ago, I said, I want to stay in relationships. I'm gonna, I want to get married. I want to have kids. I want to do that whole thing. And having experienced the marriage and the divorce and the children and being in, I'm in a new relationship for a couple of years now, I feel totally confident that it is my spiritual practice to be in relationship. And that I haven't always been so good at it. And I've you know, made my mistakes and I've been reactive and I still am at times, but I feel totally clear for myself that it's part of my healing to show up and to, to make, you know, to be as kind as possible and supportive as possible and patient as possible. And also know that they have to be kind and supportive and patient with me at times. And that's what we're, and that it's a healing experience relationship at, and I am currently in relationship with somebody who also sees it that way as our practice. And it's so helpful if you have a partner that also sees it as practice and, you know, and knows that we're in this together and it's going to be messy sometimes. And we're in this healing process together. Um, it's much more difficult when you're the only one that's trying to be conscious in the relationship. Some of you have experienced that much more difficult, much more better, you know, if you're both tr at least trying, my experience. Also, just because, you know, Sarah, I know a little bit about where your question is coming from, and it's an important piece. Just because somebody's a Buddhist doesn't mean they're going to show up good in relationships. And just because they say all of the right <laughs> things doesn't mean they're going to uh, have the skills. You know, that's the thing about Buddhism can learn all the right things to say pretty quickly. Oh yeah, compassion and non-attachment and everything's impersonal. But to really embody that and to be able to show up in that way takes a long time. And, um, and a lot of people are using meditation and even Buddhism as a way to avoid and bypass rather than fully uh, become intimate and vulnerable with their emotions and how to respond to our emotions. So a few more minutes, other, let's get off of the relationships talk, topic. <laughs> Wait, Jeff has a joke. <laughs> Jeff says, why don't Buddhists vacuum in the corners? <laughs> Oh, no, no guesses no guesses come on yeah we got it we got it no attachments we got it that's as bad as the hot dog one ramage please um I'm curious about sort of the um, pragmatic or, or you know the real approach. To, you know, as you heard the hypothetical, like you know, there's there's 
a bunch of noise in front of me. There's like a hundred people on a plane with a virus because they're about to skydive over LA. If they do, then a million people in LA will get the virus and die. You could shoot down the plane and kill the hundred people, or you could kill them. You know, you know that. You're familiar yeah. With that scenario. The ethical dilemma of nonviolence. Yeah. yeah, but then I, but then it feels to me like in real life, it's more like maybe the people on the plane have a virus, maybe they don't, mm -hmm. maybe. You know, so it's like you might just be killing regular people on the plane, or um, you know, maybe you have some family members on the plane, but they definitely have a virus. You know, or you know, like we're we're like you want to be kind or do the right thing, but you know, by being kind to one person, you're being unkind to another, or you know, or hurting one person helps another person, sort of, or vice versa. Like in those sorts of situations, is really trying to find the ethical best action. Mm -hmm. How much of it is theoretical and how much of it is stuff that's actually happening in your life? Well, you know, yeah. I know a little it's, bit. It's pretty I'm, direct. But, pretty direct. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. Um, I feel like the question is, you know, what do we, uh, when it feels like the right thing to do is going to cause some harm to someone, but it's going to protect someone else. Maybe it's going to protect more people than it's going to harm kind of issue. I don't know the answer to it. Um, Buddha seemed to be completely and totally pacifist, nonviolent, um, and literally chose not to physically do anything to stop murderers. I don't know if he, I guess from the stories, um, you know, some of the stories, it's some of its myths, some of its archetype, but from the stories, the Buddha was trained as a warrior. His father was a warrior king and he was trained and he was a great marksman and he had all of this sort of military training. So probably the Buddha could have kicked some ass. It's like fucking black belt ninja shit. <laughs> but he chose a path of complete nonviolence. And even when people went to kill all of his relatives, he showed up and tried to have a dialogue with them and tried to speak some compassion and some wisdom to them. Uh, and that worked a little bit. It was like a, a cousin of his was gonna wipe out his, his clan, his family. Um, based on some resentments and some mistreating from the past, you know, how these things work. And, but he didn't do anything physical and wasn't willing to um, in any way cause harm in order to stop someone from causing harm. So the Buddhist party line is passivism. That may or may not make sense to you. My own practical, this isn't really your question, but I, and I've said this before, my own practical um, evolution of that in my own life is that I feel willing to engage physically um, for self-defense or to defend others, short of murdering, but that if I am being attacked or my family or somebody um, that I would, I'd get involved, I'd physically, I'd fight a little bit. I'd, I'd get into some, what looks like violence in order to protect. I wouldn't attack somebody. And, and even there, you know, this is theoretical for me because I haven't been attacked in many years. Um, but if I got attacked, I wouldn't just take it. There's a teaching in, in the Buddha's teaching where he says, if you're attacked and they're holding you down and they're cutting off your arms and your legs, just radiate loving kindness to them. <laughs> so that's the, that's the Buddha's teaching. I, I believe that that's... But I feel like for me, like, no, nah, I'm not going to just, I'm going to kick them in the nuts and, you know, I'm going to do what I can to stop the attack. But I feel committed, at least um, internally committed to uh, not cross the line from defending into intentionally harming. There feels like a line between self-defense and violence where I'm intentionally, you're, I'm afraid, I'm angry, I'm gonna now hurt you on purpose, not just to stop an attack, not just to defend. But, you know, ultimately Buddhism teaches 
um, the total nonviolence path. It's hard to accept sometimes. And you might find, you know, it might be one of those things where that doesn't fit with your ethics and that um, you land more in the kind of revolutionary, um, you know, more Malcolm X than, 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 than Dr. King. Like, fuck that, let's fight. And I know there's a big part of me that's like, no, fuck that, let's fight. Um, but Buddhism says, nope, let's not. Let's love. Let's have compassion, which is not a very good self-defense strategy. And it didn't, you know, there's the big examples of how like, uh, one of the reasons the Chinese so easily occupied and created a, a full genocide in Tibet was because the Tibetans were nonviolent. So when you have a nonviolent culture, it's really easy for violent cultures to just be like, oh, we're going to fucking wipe you out and take your resources because you're not even going to fight back. So it doesn't like for national security and for, you know, doesn't work very well. but for personal happiness works very well in my experience <laughs> works very well to be nonviolent. please yeah yeah Uh, the question, this will, we'll, we'll end with this one tonight, um, is, you know, talking about non-attachment and um, she's saying that, you know, seeing this cycle, this pattern of like, I'm trying, but in some ways trying to let go feels like somehow even fuels more. And then, and then maybe also there's some Buddhist judgment of like, I'm supposed to let, I'm supposed to be non-attached. Like I know better than this, but I'm super attached and I have all this craving and um, I don't know what the right story or analogy or anything is, but my sense is trying to let go. That, that dance of like, yep, super attached. I'm trying to let go and it's, I'm not very good. And I keep, I really quickly only get a breath or two before my mind starts craving again. But those breath or two of coming, letting go coming back to the present, letting go, coming back to the present over and over and over. Those are moments of freedom rather than just surrendering me like, fuck it. I'm going to just live my life in craving and attachment because I'm not very good at non-attachment. Keep trying to let go over and over, letting go as many moments throughout the day as you can let go and see it. And also kind of reflect on and know like, okay, this is, what my mind does and investigate. Okay, there's this craving here, second noble truth, name it, oh, craving, clinging. This story that the mind makes up of, I need to have that, to get that, to be that, whatever it is, in order for me to be happy and investigate it and be like, oh, well, what an interesting and, and compelling story my mind is telling me. What does wisdom know about this, right? What, is, what does the Dharma teach me about this impermanent goal that I'm totally convinced when I get there, that's going to be it. I'm going to be so fucking happy for how long, right? The craving. Craving is repetitive, right? Because hope, I hope you get what you want. I hope you all get what you want, <laughs> not what you deserve. What you want, <laughs> On some level, because once you get there and you, you know, have that, then you wake up to like, it didn't fucking work. Every time my mind is so convincing, when I get what I want, I'm going to be stoked. And then you get what you want. And you're like, that's eh, pretty good. Could be better. I want more. I want it to be bigger, different, shinier. I was talking really recently, like, I want a bigger house. And then you get the bigger house. This fucking house is too big. I want a smaller house. And you get a smaller house, you know, just like how the repetitive 
treadmill of craving ends. So remember that, of course you're craving. It's not your fault. You're not gonna practice perfect non-attachment, but also know like, oh yeah, craving again, big surprise, letting go. Craving again, big surprise, letting go. Craving again, clinging again. This is the reality that we live in. This is the noble truth of the cause of human suffering. Not your fault, not your fault, not personal, not self. Everyone is craving, everyone is clinging, everyone's mind does that. It's millions of years of biological evolution that have led to a survival instinct that craves and clings. That helps. They're like, oh, look what my mind is doing again. And that, you know what I'm saying by big surprise, where you kind of take it lightly, not take it so personally, like, oh yeah, of course I'm, of course I'm doing that again. I do that every day about something. My mind is always doing that about something. And the more I'm mindful and see through the impermanent nature of that and the impersonal nature of that repetitive craving, the less I get seduced by it. And the more I relate to it, oh, craving again. Oh, good morning, craving. Yes, I'm about to get out of bed. Yes, I hear you. You want the day to be the way you want it to be. I get it. And relating to the mind and the desire system rather than believing it and being so identified with it that we take it all personally and we kind of try to obey it and, and believe that you'll be so happy when you get the relationship, the career, the savings, whatever it is that your mind is saying, you'll be happy when you get. Somebody recently, I think it was Dan, uh, a few a couple months ago said, you know, well, what do we do about this? The ambition for career. And I was like, go for it. Whatever you're craving, go for it. But remember, it's not going to work. <laughs> go for it. Get what you want. But remember, it's not going to really work for the happiness that you really want. There's no material or sensual solution, period. What we really want is in here. And it comes from compassion and non-attachment and wisdom. And there's no external circumstance that's going to lead to that satisfaction that you're seeking. It's all in here. But in the meantime, go for it. Get married. Get the job. Do all of those things with as much wisdom and non-attachment and compassion as you can muster in the process. That's my TED talk. I am uh, happily going on vacation this week. I'll be gone for three weeks and um, Monday night will continue. Um, Ward, who is somebody who teaches a Friday night class and is a long-term student and friend of mine, uh, will be subbing two of the weeks. Jason Murphy, who teaches the Wednesday night class, will be here next week and then Ward the other two weeks. Uh, remember, you're not here for me. You're here for each other. So just because I'm not here, don't ditch class. Come to class anyways. Be with the Sangha. Support the visiting teachers who are going to be here for the next three weeks. And I'll see you when I get back from Bali. I'll, I'm going to have so much fun for you. I'll be sending you all loving kindness. And, um, and I'll be back August 12th. And I'll teach um, whatever that first Monday is, I think the 15th or whatever it is. So I'll be back in three weeks. Um, class is done by donation. I need lots of donations to help me with my vac vacation tonight. <laughs> so um, be generous. And uh, there's a link in the chat there from uh, those of you on Zoom. And if you're here, you can put cash in the bowl or you can, Tara will be at the desk. Thank you for the help, Tara, at the desk. And um, Brian, thanks for setting up as always. Um, Jeff and Emily, thanks for the help on hosting the Zoom. So uh, be as generous as you would like to be and see you in a few weeks. May any goodness that comes from our practice be shared outward in all directions with all living beings. Oh, one last announcement, two announcements, sorry. <laughs>
This Wednesday, I will be, uh, before I go on my vacation, I'm going to San Francisco. I'm going to do Soma Dharma Wednesday night in San Francisco, which is Jeff's, um, who's our my assistant here online. Um, it's his meditation group. It's at 7 p.m. Uh, Wednesday night in San Francisco. If you know anybody in San Francisco that wants to come meditate with me and Jeff and the, the Sangha up there, um, it's, I think it's on the Instagram. You'll find it on mine or on the Against the Stream. Um, so Wednesday night. The other thing is the Against the Stream seven-day retreat in the fall in October uh, is open for registration. Really consider coming and sitting for a week and deepening your wisdom, your compassion, your non-attachment, your freedom. And that's open for, for registration. Hope some of you join us for that. Okay, now you can go. See you next time. <laughs>